Hello everyone, welcome to the live stream today discussing the how of transitioning to a healthy soil. My name is Nicola Maddock and I'm from Nutrisoil. Nutrisoil is a big worm farm in northern Victoria who produce a quality vermi liquid used in broadacre agriculture and support farmers in increasing their soil health. I'm here also with Luke Harrington from Regen Farming. Luke is a regenerative agriculture advisor who specialises in helping farmers one-on-one -on -one transition into a regenerative farming system. Luke also makes KNF brews, Korean natural farming brews, which are an on-farm biostimulant made from indigenous microorganisms from your own farm. And I have David Hardwick with us, agroecologist from Soil Land Food, who provides extension in healthy soil and helps people and organisations all over Australia, both in person and online. David also has a team of people who delivers courses in making your own compost, uh, grazing management uh, and biofertilisers. Both Luke and David are part of the NutriCell Hub Care Program, assisting farmers transitioning to healthy soil. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Good to be here. Wonderful. Nutrisoil receives consistent feedback from farmers that they need more support in transitioning <coughs> to healthy soil. So we thought that we would come together today and ask the experts on some ideas about how to lower our fertilisers and our chemical load into healthier soils producing healthy food. So Luke, I thought that we might uh, start with you. You've just uh, completed a blog on how to transition to healthy soil. So I'm gonna open it up to you first. Tell us what's some of the first steps you need to consider. What I've found th uh, through talking to lots of farmers and, and helping them transition through is your mindset is the greatest uh, place that you need to start. Um, and being truthful with yourself, what you're doing, and, and, and having a, a what and a why and a how organised uh, in, in your mind to be able to take those first steps. Being clear in what direction and what, what you actually, what outcomes you want economically Absolutely. and for the business as well, isn't it? Yeah, yep. that's right. Mm. That's, okay, that's and do you help people with that? Or? Absolutely, yep. Um, we sit down at the, at the table and we, we talk about where they are, where they'd like to go, how they'd like to do it, and then um, what their goals are, and then we just try and work out a plan over, say, four or five years to transition across. Mm. Okay, and, and, and David, it, similar? That, that's the key thing. It's not an overnight thing. It does take some time. So you've got to be a bit patient and you've got to plan realistically, um, but also be a bit bold, <coughs> take some risks. So it's about risk-taking, but also being careful as well at the same time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I guess there's lots of farming systems we're talking about. So we're talking about cropping, pasture, horticulture, um, mixed so farming, sugar mixed, cane, absolutely. Yeah. So today, I guess we need to um, keep it a bit broad, so we're in context for everybody. Um, well, should we start with those broad principles, David? What What are the broad principles that you would start with? Well, I guess if you're transitioning to a regenerative or ecologically based approach, really soil health is underpins that system um, from the sort of natural capital that you manage on farm, you know, the soil, the water, etc. Soil health's at the heart of that. So I guess in a way you can call it soil health based farming, I guess is another term we could use here. And I guess to get soil health, you need air and water, you need ground cover, and then obviously you need living plant roots, some diverse plant roots. And I think if we stick to those basics initially, anything that helps you with those three or four things, air, water, diverse plant roots, you're kind of starting in the right direction, I guess. Yeah, probably be an initial step anyway. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I guess there's a few ways to get there. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. So you could use plants uh, initially, or you could use uh, some type of ripping and then sowing plants. Um, what are the different scenarios you might use these different things? It really depends on the context that mm -hmm. you're in. So it's really hard to sit here and be specific about someone's particular paddock without standing in there and talking and looking at all the information. Um, but there's a basic skeleton that I like to follow and um, air and water, very first thing. You need to worry about your whole system as holistically 
and and your chemistry in your soil needs to be you need to worry about that you need to worry about your biological system in your soil you need to worry about your um, your plant selection all those things come into it so it's really hard to say yes let's do this in this particular paddock at this from here but that's something you sort of need to have someone come out and talk to you about because mm, it's really like air and water and plant roots is common to any paddock anywhere on the planet really if you're doing farming but what is there a chemical constraint like high magnesium or aluminium or pH is that a problem in one soil and another soil maybe low carbon is the bigger yeah. barrier so you've really got to look okay for this paddock what are the what is the next barrier or soil constraint that, yeah. that I have to address to kickstart that self-organising biological system and it is yeah. as Luke said it can be quite specific but the principle is air water and plant roots yeah. whatever we can do to get them moving yeah. Yeah. obviously in grazing we've got different tools in cropping and we've got different tools in the toolbox yeah so you've spoken about soil tests there i know they are part of the system how important is it to get a soil test initially yeah i think they're definitely useful in most cases um, sometimes just changing your grazing or growing a crop of oats. I remember early in my career an old agronomist said to me, a biological agronomist said to me, before you do a soil test, grow, grow a crop of oats on the paddock and then do the soil test after that, which was I've always sort of remembered. But generally they are a really useful tool to, to do as part of getting a holistic picture, as Luke's pointed out, to get that holistic picture. But don't forget to get the spade out and go out in the paddock as well, I guess is, is a key thing. Yeah. yeah. I think the soil tests have been something that people have concentrated on quite heavily in the past. Um, are, are people still using that as such a, a strong um, tool or are we starting to really look at other things as well? I think in, the, in a lot of the people that I work with, they still rely on it very heavily um, and it's an education process. For me, I like to get a really good soil test done at the start of a program and then we might look at it again in four or five years time and just um, and, and use observation and if we have something specific that we need to test for well we can test for it like if we know we've got really low phosphorus we want to lift that up we do something about it then we can just do a specific phosphorus test save a few is, dollars yeah. you, know, you don't need to do the full test you could just yeah. get phosphorus tests for you know 20 bucks instead yeah. of spending an 80 100 dollar test every year yeah for those few years so yeah. yeah they're all i guess it's it's taking a holistic approach so whichever information helps you make that holistic decision and soil tests are part of that so you know that's definitely the principle yeah, yeah. Uh, you run a course called Reboot My Soil, David, and I've done yep. it a number of times with you. Yep. It's part of the NutriSoil Hub program. And I still remember um, some of these instances where someone might have really high magnesium soils. And our first question is, well, how do we address that? And your first answer is, well, are you growing good grass? So sometimes yeah. those deficiencies aren't actually what we need to get hung, hung up on. Yeah, just because a soil test says something's not right doesn't mean it isn't right. If in the paddock it looks all right, you've got to decide whether you go on them, what the soil test tells you or what you're seeing in front of your eyes and what the animals are telling you. So you have to kind of go, well, the soil test is not perfect, so it's a useful tool, but it definitely doesn't tell you everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think too with the soil test side of things, if you can get your IMOs going, your indigenous microorganisms going, they can go out and and change that whole that whole scenario of what the plant can get get hold of. So for me, that's a real key in the start starting out in in that process is to get that IMOs fired up. Mm -hmm. But chemistry does have a bit to do with that as well. So if you're a real low calcium, sometimes that can be a little bit difficult. Yeah, is, it, is there a barrier to getting biological function mm -hmm. going? Because the, the plant roots are going to encourage beneficial microbes and life around them. They've been doing that for a couple of hundred million years to get to, to but sometimes there's just such a barrier that the whole system can't get moving. You know, the, the doors close just too tightly for everyone to come in the room. So if that's low calcium or pH or structural problem, then they've got to fix that to, to get the party started. Once the party started, the plants will do the hard work for you if you manage them well. Yeah. 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 And I guess to work out which one you need to work on first, it's really just having a dig and having a look at that soil structure. Would that be the first place to start? Yep, absolutely. Dig in the, and, and have, have a look. Do some really basic tests like a water infiltration test. Um, have a look at the roots. Where are they going? What are they doing? Look at the structure. Is, is there structure or is it just 
really compacted, no air and water can get in. And, um, and temperature is temperature, hot yeah. on the surface. Yeah. Sealed is the surface sealed over. Yeah. So yeah, mm-hmm. there's there's quite a few things that you can do. And I David's got, got some good YouTube videos uh, on how to do some of those tests. Um, and and you can always get someone out to do it, but they're really simple to do yourself. Um, yeah, I think that's that's one of the first places you would start. Well, I guess you know the topic of today is all about making a transition, and the first step is to help improve your own skills and knowledge yeah. around this whole topic before you're going to make big decisions. Build your knowledge base, build your confidence, yeah. and part of that is learning how to assess your yes. soil a bit more holistically yeah. and understand that it's a living thing. Get your head around that side to it. Yeah, yeah. it's probably the first step after setting the goals in, in this transition process. I think there's another really big step that people f- really struggle with, and that's FOMO and FUPO. <laughs> FOMO so being FOMO being fear of other, uh, fear of missing out. Yep. And FUPO is fear of other people's opinions. I'm thinking of FOP, fear of non-production. <laughs> So, yeah. and there is no reason why, if done correctly in your transition, that you should lose any yield or, or not profit. so much your profit is the word I'm looking for. You shouldn't lose profit, you should gain profit. And uh, if it's done correctly and over time and you take the time it takes. And think about your profit equation over a 10-year cycle rather than a boom and bust one-year cycle. And yeah. it's really probably one of the big differences with regenerative agronomy and generative approach to the more 20th century conventional approach which is quite boom and bust it's let's get a you know let's get a high yielding crop this season and we'll worry about next season next year yeah. we've got to really change that around and go yeah but this is, farming's a long long haul we're in it for the long haul and it's the long term average that matters because that's what will keep you on the farm not the short term boom and bust so yeah. yeah so that 10 year <laughs> business plan it takes commitment doesn't it so i think going back to that first uh, the people, the goals, their values, yeah. what they really want is yeah. really the key to having that commitment yeah. to that 10-year plan because if you fail, it's easy to go back to what you know. Absolutely. That's why I use the what, why and how. So your what is your goals or your issues and problems um, and then your why is is why do you have those goals or why do you have those problems and that's the why is what keeps you on the, on the straight and narrow and keeps you moving forward. Um, and gives you the um, desire to keep going when you do have the odd failure here and there. And yeah, it's up to you to find out what that why might be, um, whether it be financial, health reasons, or there's so many different reasons why people do it. But um, it's, yeah, you have to have a good why. Yeah. And I think the why is also in the how too, David, when you say people need to go out and educate themselves. So why, what's my problem with having a bare fallow? You know, what is it holding me back from, but what's it helping me with? And what's the, you know, choice that I'm going to make here? Yeah, that's right. So if you've got some of those fundamentals, it helps your reason, think through the reasoning why you make, why you, why you would choose one management decision over another, yeah, rather than just blindly following something. Whether it's someone on YouTube or it's your agronomist or whoever, you know, they yeah. just blindly follow it as yeah. best you can, make an informed decision. Yeah. yeah. And the thing that I find is um, in the regenerative world or the, the soil health world, everybody wants to come up with a, a really fancy um, paragraph of what regenerative farming is and all these sorts of things. It's really, for me, it's really simple. Is my soil going to be better tomorrow for the decision I make today? And, and and moving forward, just little little steps, and once you get the ball rolling, the steps seem to get bigger and bigger. So I think that's a really important. It comes back again to to your thought process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pia Yeomans, the old famous Yeomans plow guy, you know, he said that agriculture itself can be a soil making process. So he's trying to say, you know, we can do agriculture, but can we also improve that soil health while we're doing agriculture? And it is a step by step process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess, so you're getting down to the specifics of things, but take yourself back to your wider reasoning. So it's such a balance, isn't it? And I think um, we want to talk about, you know, some of these transition tools. And I know it's quite broad because we've got different farming systems listening today. 
Uh, but if you felt like your fertiliser was at a higher rate than you were comfortable with and you, you knew that that was probably holding you back from building root systems and building that structure, what are some of the first steps that you might take? Just pull the plug on it. <laughs> Get rid of all the fertiliser, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Go cold turkey. Yeah, that's one I way. hope you're in David. That's one way you can do it. Uh, so... My, my advice to anybody who's a high fertiliser, high chemistry use, is start to sti stimulate your native microbiome and reduce your fertiliser maybe by 20% in the first year. Then the next year you might go another 10% or another 10% after that and, and assess as you're going along whether you're, whether you're moving forwards, backwards, left or right or up and down. So. Um, so bit by bit, and as you follow that skeleton through, you'll find that you should be able to then start to remove sort of insecticides and fungicides as your soil health gets better and the, and the biology in the soil can protect your plants. And, and the plant health um, genetic systems kick in, yeah. they kick in because they're actually driven a lot by the soil microbiome or the IMOs, as Luke was saying, you know, they trigger that plants to genetically express its yeah. plant disease and health yeah. so yeah and yeah and what a lot of us don't realize is that when we're putting out a large amount of fertilizer we're actually changing that plant's um, physiology we're we're stopping it from exudating out what it needs to get the 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 bugs in the soil to do the job that they are designed to do that yeah, and mother nature's been doing it for 4.3 billion years so there's a bit of a balancing act, I guess, because, you know, there is a place for fertilisers, but, you know, what is that sweet spot? Yeah. And it's about maintaining high-performance, high healthy soil but and then balancing that with what yield goals I have. Yeah. But at a certain point, yeah, you, you lose the balance and then you're on the bandwagon of high inputs and yeah. um, problem compounding upon problem often. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, the tricky part that we can um, probably find ourselves in is then when we've got our reliance on that fertiliser budget comparing uh, and adding that fertiliser budget and rainfall to the expected yield. So that is that is agronomy, that is how it works when you're, you've got a cropping system and what we're trying to do is kind of work with that a little but not follow that. So we've got this pull and take with, well, with just agronomy. Rather than a short term yield potential let's go with the 10 year yield potential and rather than a boom and bust type approach yeah. let's go with an even more even long term average yield potential as a goal because that's usually the ecological optimum as well as the economic or profit optimum usually and the more risky your climate the more that long term average is important so yeah, yeah absolutely and and it, it, once again, I just we just got to go back to the soil health and getting that air and water in. I've seen some crops grown on like 25 mil of rain, and you go, how does that happen? And um, it's because I ran around the paddock naked. Yeah, <laughs> don't tell anyone. While yeah. we're on TV. Sorry. Uh, so you just got to ask, yeah, right. ask your question. Ask the question, how 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 does that happen? And, and let's work, all work towards that because we are in Australia. We are going to we are going to go back to that at some stage. So, yeah. and, and the don't you know our understanding around the microbiome in the soil and how it relates to plant roots and how that relates to structure, plant available water dynamics, water uptake efficiency of plants, movement of water from depth to shallow areas of the it's just really now just emerging. So we're seeing these really impressive agronomic results like what Luke's just described, and we're only now just starting to understand why and how this yeah. is happening and down to systems theory and all of this sort of modern stuff that agronomy's got to catch up with, basically. Yeah. 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 Uh, I guess going back to that why is going to help people have that discussion with the agronomist as to that 10-year plan. And I do think that, that that's something that um, people probably just need that little bit more confidence with but it's also doing those courses. You talked about reducing at 20%, but you also talked, Luke, about uh, getting your biology um, in your soil moving. Is, it, is reducing the fertiliser getting your biology in your soil moving, moving, or are there other things that you need to do to...? The reducing of the fertiliser helps not damage the biology as much, um, and, but you need to, to stimulate it. There's, there's, depending on the situation that you're in, so if you're in a grazing situation, your um, grazing management could help. 
um, cropping, um, plant extracts help, liquid vermicast helps. Um, the Inoc choice inoculants yeah, yeah inoculants things like that get get the system booted and then it's your management after that that's really important because uh, there's no point in me stimulating that biology and then throwing a heap of fertilizer at it and dumbing it down again because that's that's how we've got there in the first place so. so it's that commitment again to that long-term yeah. plan when you see the potential of a yield in a certain season. Yeah. Yeah. And, and once again, your profit will, should not go down if you go about it the right way. Uh, it, where I find people run into, into trouble is they get so excited about the prospect of, of something happening, they go, oh, I'll just cut it by 50%. And the guys who do that, they... They do, they cut the yield by 50% and their profit by 50% um, quite often. So it's about yeah, just taking Step baby steps. steps. Yeah. Yeah. And look, there are people's, um, um, uh, what do you call it, um, personalities that just want to do that. Yeah. And they're really hard to stop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that is a difficult thing for, for someone like myself. Yeah. Um, and then once again, you have to be truthful in what you're doing because I know many times when I speak to a farmer, oh yeah, I'm not a high input user. I go, oh yeah, right, eh? you go, only 80 kgs of DAP up front. I go, yeah, no worries. And that's it, yep, that's it. Then you drive out there a couple of uh, a few weeks later and the, uh, the spreader truck's going up and down the paddock and they're putting out 150 kgs of urea, but they haven't taken that into account. So you've got to, you've got to be truthful with yourself. Um, and you might just have to knock that by, back by to 100 kilos instead of 150. There's been, I guess, over the years of learning what regenerative farming is, um, discussions about you don't need lime, you don't need gypsum, you don't need uh, synthetic fertilisers. Um, do you want to comment on that, David? I think as we mentioned right at the beginning of this session, you know, context is everything. Um, and there's a time and a place where you want to trigger change. Yeah. I think everyone agrees that biological processes are the plant root, plant, diverse plant root systems and the microbiome that lives in associate with them drives a lot of soil function and we're trying to get that back. And in different soils it can be running 0 out of 10 function and in other soils it might be 7 or 8 out of 10. So yeah, there's a time for some intervention and it, so, but sometimes you need to get rid of the aluminium or you need to bump the calcium or you need to get rid of prove that structure to get this biological happening if you just leave it it may well it will transform the soil over time the, but in maybe the lag time might be too long for your agricultural yeah. goals so yeah there's a time and place for it but we're all everyone whichever perspective people are on we're all on this same end point which is where biological self-organization is the main game that we manage and we just assist it i think that's where yeah. everyone's headed but we've yeah. got different opinions on how to get there yeah. And I think context of uh, different soil types, different climates. So it might mean that some soil types it's just not worth the money of, of putting a whole heap of lime on and some soil types it, it might be a profitable yeah. investment. You might not be able to spread lime because it's too rocky and steep. So. Yeah or yeah. match my enterprise to that yeah. soil situation. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just trying to keep this in context for so mm. many different farming yeah. systems and places yeah. out there. And that also comes down to your tools as well. Yeah. So I can't, I don't want to spend a lot of money on spreading two or three tonne of lime, uh, which I'd suggest you probably shouldn't do most of the time, maybe a little bit at a time, but you might be able to use something like a prill or something like that to, to give your plant that calcium that it needs. Uh, in your early stages of transition. And it's about understanding what your tools can do for you. Mm. So getting out there and finding the people that have all these different tools yeah. that might suit your yeah. farming system. Yeah. yeah. Well, getting connected to a community of other farmers that are also trying to learn because that's how you'll learn. Yeah. So, you know, you can get it connected with you with Nutrisoil and other, you know, proponents out there like yeah. Luke and myself, but it's really sharing with other farmers that are yeah. practicing as well is really important. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and back with the fertiliser thing, once you've knocked back to a certain degree, you may, you may be able to go across to a foliar um, application, but I don't think that if, you, if your soil's not working properly, the foliars are really just a band-aid, um, whereas like when, you're, when they're working properly, they can really make big changes. Yeah. And 
So I think it's once again you've got to understand your tools. Sometimes yes. it's not even a band-aid, it's a tax minimisation yeah. activity. But yeah, so you're not really addressing the underpinning stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I have seen mm. both. I've certainly seen soils that have been really flooded and then compacted and they haven't got that cycling happening. When they're using the foliar fertiliser, instead of two, they're needing to put out ten to keep it going. Yeah. And, and that's what it is, isn't it? That function isn't happening below. So it's going back to that basics First, your your why and your ten year plan, then your structure. Yeah, water and plant roots. Yeah. Yeah. You need those three things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and a lot of people want to know like really advanced stuff. Yeah, and I'll go back to my horsemanship uh, lessons here. Um, and advan- learning advanced stuff is just better basics. Yeah. Doing the basics with excellence, and mm-hmm. if you can get those basics done really well you'll be surprised at just how well things will go for you. I think that sort of probably sums up our soil, you know, training and extension activities we do. It's just going over the fundamentals, getting them, doing them really well, and you'll, you'll make good decisions. Yeah. yeah. Mm. We've got some case studies today. Do we want to just dive into those yep, a little bit? Yeah, we to ask <laughs> Karen on about yeah. it. Yeah. All right, so um, a question that's just come in from the live feed is what is the best way to handle pasture paddocks that are heavily dominated by cooch grass, thinking ahead to a more desirable multi-species situation? Who's going to take that one? Oh, I'll start it and then Luke can jump in and <laughs> give you his perspective. I guess cooch is often a sign of compaction, so it's a running grass, so it'll often thrive where you've got tighter, compacted <laughs> soil. Um, so, yeah, I mean, changing... Changing the grazing pressure and duration is to, to sort of planned or rotational grazing, whatever term you like to use, is probably a key tactic. Um, and that will immediately shift the um, influence of the animals on the soil and the pasture, and you'll probably start to see other species come in. So that would be, and, and you'll improve the structure. Um, and then, yeah, then the next tactic will probably be to start to try and drill some preferred multi-species mixes in. Yeah. But if you don't change the grade, if you keep the current grazing and or traffic management that encouraged the cooch in the beginning, yeah. you're just going to stay there or go back there in a year or two. Yeah. So, yeah. And I just like to go back to the what, why and how. So so the what here is uh, is the cooch and, and then we have to ask ourselves why mm. yeah. and generally compaction it's often, um, a, often yeah. an issue yes. um, low humus <laughs> um, calcium deficiencies those sorts of things seem to be an issue so if you start to multi-prong things as well you can speed the process up a little I am a little bit in, um, impatient sometimes and um, if you can stack things um, that really helps but yeah grazing is mm. definitely you may need to do a rip yeah. just to trigger air and water to get That's in there right. to help your your preferred species that you've sown as yeah. well. Yeah. 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 yeah, my question was if we direct drilled into a grass like that, what would be the success of, of yeah, germination? It depends how tight the soil yeah. is and how vigorous the cooch is yeah. and the time of year that you're doing and all of those things come yeah. into play. So yeah. I know Cole Sice, <coughs> Cole used to, you know, when he was trying to rehabilitate very worn out, hard setting cropping country would would use a tined implement just to break it up a bit, yeah. you know, like just those small tactics yeah. to implement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and going back to, again, that first discussion, what are you comfortable with? Are you okay with resetting with, in that scenario with some a, a knockdown yeah. or would you rather use some tillage um, or do you, do you really just want to use animals and grazing? I mean, there's a few, I mean, so RCS yeah. is somewhere I would um, recommend someone to... Um, look into for grazing yep. management there's um holistic grazing courses and also uh david soil and food will have some yeah, grazing courses Dr. Judy, Judy, Dr. Dr. Great. Judy so, is amazing yeah, plenty of grazing support yeah. out there from yeah. the kind yeah. of those guys and there's some fantastic farmers out there that are doing it like yeah. i've got zoe that works for me uh, down in stall she's great to talk to because she actually is doing it mm. she lives it and breathes it loves it yeah, yeah. so they're the and they're when you're looking for someone to help you that's such an important thing is to have someone who's who's cares as much about your place as you do yeah. and your outcomes as you do like and don't just don't get someone who's there for the money i suppose mm. yeah it's yeah. a really important thing it's yeah. tricky isn't it so yeah. um considering if if you are wanting to reset that cooch grass pasture 
um, and you've got your choices of how you're going to get those seeds in there. How can you get some biology in there as well? On the seed, it's probably the easiest way um, at the start, but you can put it out with your foliar sprays. Um, really important when you're doing a foliar spray that you structure the spray properly. So you start out with um, really clean water. So I was, I was always knew that water quality was important until about five, uh, but I didn't realise how important until about five years ago I was watching a webinar and if you've got over 150 parts per million, your product of, chlorine. of, of hardness, yep. of um, uh, your product can be up to 70% affected. So yeah. like just those things and then when what you put in next is really important. I've just done a blog on this too. Okay. So, um, so then you put in any nutrition that you wanted to and then you put in any biostimulants bio that you wanted to yeah. and then, then, uh, then you put in any biology that you wanted to last of all so it's all diluted down. Yeah. And if you're really pressed and you wanted to do a herbicide, you'd put that in first. So I think it's really important to understand how that stacks as well. And when you're talking about stacking, you're talking about in the tank. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know it's pretty common not just in agriculture, but when you're trying to change and do something different, if you don't know the tin tax of that technique, it can fail on you, and then you go, well, that doesn't work. So you know it's it's about the detail, but make the strategic decision first. <laughs> I'm going to use stimulants and biology in my program, and then make sure you learn some of the fine tips on how to do it yeah. as best I can. Otherwise you'll just shrug your shoulders and go, yeah. and then you go one step forward and one step back. But yeah, you've got to commit. And committing means taking the making the time and effort to learn how to do it properly. Yeah. 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 And learn uh, you know, what type you want to use. You can make your own. Yeah, yeah um, all, all those. But yeah. you've got to, if you're committed, you've got to put in that extra effort to learn. And this yeah. is probably the, another big thing about regenerative ag is, you can't be lazy mentally. <laughs> you got to, yeah. you got to get in there and learn a bit yourself, not just rely yeah. on someone else to make all your decisions. You might still have your agronomist, but you've got to be informed. Yeah, yeah. Mm, makes yeah. us happier farmers too, doesn't yeah. it? Being yeah. stimulated and creative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. the amount of guys that I've worked with over the last ten years that they're just happy farmers, like yeah. Johnny Hay. He mm. just he is the happiest dairy farmer I know. Yeah. So because you know, he's excited every day by what, what new grass is growing that he never planted there. Mm. Like, it's really exciting. Yeah, probably Brendan Cunningham, the guy yeah. in the Gibson, would be the only other one that's happy yeah. as him. But, yeah, those two are very happy dairy farmers, yeah. 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 All right, let's go on to the next question. I'll call yeah. this one a case study. Um, we're making progress transitioning from unfriendly to a more soil plant friendly system using biology and amino acid, fermented fertilizers and less herbicides, no fungicides or insecticides. However, we are challenged by our sandy sand. This harvest just passed, we had a paddock average of three tonne of wheat with patches going from six tonne to 0.6 tonne per hectare on the poor sands. Rotation is uh, harvesting vetch for seed, wheat, mixed species pasture, and then barley. Organic carbon is 0.6, cation exchange capacity 3. The soil is water repellent and it's cold. It's in the bottom of Australia, I understand. Uh, 10 to 12 degrees. P levels are around 20 parts per million. That should make some people feel better. Uh, tissue and sap tests are often similar to the better parts of the paddock. Uh, magnesium and manganese can be lower. Uh, using the soil monitor test, we could have bacteria levels of 300 to 600 and fungi of 1 to 50. Indicator plants, brome and ryegrass. Sometimes in the past we could have had a bit of spear and barley grass and we can have lots of capeweed and wild turnip. Um, this is sounding familiar to anyone. Can quite easily have rust infection. Normal practice of urea plus sulfate of ammonia could bring the yield up to within a ton or so of the best. Uh, so what I'm hearing is bring it up just some. I'm probably thinking that we need to get more humates into the system and a bit of everything approach, which is what we've been talking about. Biology, nutrients and management and patience will be the way to go. What do you reckon? <laughs> I'll let you start off this one, Luke. I think Terry's answered his own question. I know, I know. To be honest. Uh, so what are you doing farming that kind of country, Terry? 
Yeah, so the first thing that stands out to me is um, his organic matter is 0.6. It's a sandy sand with sandy 0.6 sand. carbon, yeah. so it's always going to be challenging yeah. at that level. Yeah, so how, how that's, that's probably the thing that stands out the most. And um, because your carbon is where your nutrients are held, your soil life's held, your moisture's held, it's 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 just so P- important. Pivotal to soil function. Yeah. So even a sandy soil that might mm. still be low, like one percent, or and it can be quite functional. Mm. But it sounds like it's at a threshold where it's not yeah. even very functional at that point. So without being yeah. there, we're making a bit of an estimate. Yeah. 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 So it, how do I go about building that? And and the best way I know how to build carbon in a soil is growing a, a really healthy plant mm. big um, root systems yeah and, that, and, and that's probably the starting point so he's got a rotation yeah. Terry and Rose you've got a rotation in there where you do go into a mixed species pasture so yeah. I guess our question or my question might be how long does that pasture phase go for yeah. could you lengthen that out by a year or two obviously yeah. there's seasonal challenges um, so yeah just yeah. root volume yeah. a bit longer in the, in yeah. the rota- overall rotation yeah and yeah. plant diversity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, diverse. Like have that really diverse pasture in there. The other thing too is, uh, is you got the plant has to be healthy, and this is where probably the foliars do come in because if you've got a plant that's bricksing at four, it's barely living. It's like it's looking after itself to stay alive. We need it to be bricksing at that really high levels, and and photosynthesizing at its peak efficiency, pumping those exudates into the soil and creating that 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 system so the plant can really thrive so so there's a short-term tactic might be yeah. you know trialing some different foliars on mm. on the growing crops to trigger to stimulate roots yeah. and root exudation and then the longer term strategy is to maybe look at the overall five seven year rotation and yeah. get a few more get a bit more of the pasture phase in there that gives you root volume for a bit longer without yeah. disturbance yeah. yeah so i know grant sims um when he does a he goes into his worst paddock. He'll he'll go two two years at least with multi species winter summer winter mm. summer and then he'll go into his his cropping uh, his phase. Cropping phase. Yeah. Um, so that's something that you, you need yeah. to probably go those two to four years sometimes. The principle and, is yeah. root volume helping us restructure the soil, yeah. reactivate it biologically, and yeah. getting the carbon up get functional. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that long term plan and yep. some stacking. short term tactics as yeah. well. Yeah. Yep. yep. All right. Um, the next one uh, we'll move on. I've recently uh, internally fenced some paddocks. Previously, 120 acres. Now, four 30 acre paddocks. We have several other paddocks to rotate stock through. I've previously got the soil tested, sprayed calcipril and sprayed Nutrisol worm juice. Why do you spray that stuff? Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) If I kick you under the table, the microphone will make a noise. (laughs) The grass has been growing well, but the cattle were able to eat what they wanted and go wherever in that one big paddock, so the grass never really got a rest. I think I'd like to over-sow some of the paddocks with a multi-species grass, but don't want to spray the paddocks out and disturb the soil. In your experience, should I wait, sell graze the paddocks with our 100 plus steers for 12 months and see how the paddocks look, or try and over sow now before winter? Well, that comes back to your what, why, and how, and, 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 your, and what your personal uh, goals are and how quickly you want to do something. I mean, the fact that you've said to us the grass has been growing well, and so I guess we're, we've got to assume a bit that the cows are performing reasonably well yeah. as well. If that is the case, then maybe changing the grazing management to a more planned grazing with a bit higher stock density and therefore animal impact on the pastures yeah. could be a tool because you're not, you have got reasonable pasture and animal performance, maybe not ideal. Whereas yeah. if, it, if they weren't going well, then you might go in with a more stronger intervention and over so. Yeah. But I think either way, if you don't change your grazing management, yeah. the multi species, I mean, they're not going to go that well yeah. anyway. So, yeah. And once again, you've got to get out in the paddock with a shovel and, and dig. Like if you dig in there and you, and you expect to sow a multi species into a already established pasture and you've got compacted tight soils, it probably is not going to perform and you're going to do your dough. 
Um, and I crunched some numbers on your stocking rate and your stock density. So that's obviously how many animals are in any given area on any day, grazing day, what we call stock density, as, as opposed to stocking rate being how many animals on the property kind of as a long-term average. And the rule of thumb that kind of we run with in soil and food is around 200 DSCs or dry sheep equivalents, sorry you guys that work in animal units, um, per hectare, per grazing day as a minimum rule of thumb to get animal impact. You can certainly go higher than that, I'm not saying you can't, but just to get some trigger some change and biological soil function change. So I think you're running at about 100 DSCs per hectare um, with that many cows. So even if you split one or two of those paddocks again in half, you, you, you're gonna be up at that stock density where you're gonna to start to see probably a faster change yeah. in the soil or pasture yeah. system. So there's something else to think about. Yeah. And we've, we've actually done that. Um, dairy farmer has roughly four to 500 cows milking at any one time. They have eight hectares a day, moved every day. Um, never could get past a 35 day rotation. Um, didn't matter what time of the year it was, how much rain, how much fertilizer, all those sorts of things. Um, he no, now no longer puts out a lot of fertilizer, but what, we, what he did is he split that eight hectares into four, and he moved them four times a day. And within no time at all, he was out to a 60 day rotation, mm. which was too long, because um, things started to go rank. But the recovery of those pastures was staggering. You got a really good manure Even spread, yeah. really good grazing, um, um, utilization yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, what it, that, even though he had a lot more livestock on a smaller space he actually left more leaf behind mm. which builds more root yeah. volume which helps the structure of yeah. those heavier soils yeah so just yeah trying to um, bring have a think about that too and sometimes you start with your bigger paddock that's got less you've got less control over the grazing evenness maybe subdivide them up first as a priority because you know it's all yeah. about fencing and time cost and time yeah. and stage it but if you start with the bigger paddocks you might um, or even start with a small paddock where you can see the results which will encourage you to do more so either way have a think through that one as well yeah yeah mm. um and i guess a grazing management course is always one that i would just say keep learning keep building your skills yeah. there yeah okay. and you've got bruce you know it's um low stress stock handling too, or stress free stock handling sorry bruce stress free stock handling too which is a great course around animals management grazing mm. and diversity so that's a really good one to do as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and system specific i mean we've seen uh in gips uh no down the colac area the whitings they're just over mm. consistently with multi yeah. species and that really yeah. suits their system yeah. and it might not suit another system yeah. so but you've still got that planned grazing underpinning yeah. whatever you yeah. do yeah um, yeah yeah I've got another question. Uh, we've got a shuttle of Nutrisoil and plan to use it as a seed coat on our Broadacre program this year. Do we need to adjust our conventional system of seeding with MAP, 100 kilos per hectare, and spraying pre and post herbicides as well as insecticides to get the benefit of Nutrisoil? My concern is we may kill the beneficial microbes. I love it. They always answer their question at the end, don't yeah. they? <laughs> It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a, a transition, I think. So, um, Luke, you take that one. Uh, so I suppose, again, where is the insecticide? Is it going to be a, is, is it going to be sprayed out afterwards or is it on the seed? So if, if, I, if I was going to use pickled seed, um, I would be concerned yep. um, with putting a, a live, living um, product on it. I've had this conversation um, with... Martin Stapper and um, because that's we often get this question I've got pickled seed I can't do anything about it do I still coat it with Nutrisoil and um, I guess the answer that that he has and it does make sense is it makes the insecticide not work as well (laughs) yeah Yeah. and the other thing I would probably do is I would I would actually put some nutrition on that seed as well yeah just a little bit of nutrition just to make sure that plant's as healthy as it can be but if you're not pickling the seed Go flat out for it and put it on there with, and, and once again, I'd use a little bit of nutrition. And there's some great, I like nutrition products out there. Would that be according to your soil test, or? Uh, well, you could use it according to your soil test, but like I generally go for a, some, something that's got a bit of um, a bit of everything in it. Yeah. Um, 
and because just as much as anything you're actually feeding the little root yeah. zone as much yeah. as you're yeah. feeding the plant so you're yeah. just trying to give that root zone a bit of a blue ribbon yeah. stimulant yeah. because yeah. That it will then trigger the root to give you more dribble or exudation and then the whole show will yeah. grow so yeah. in a way with some of those foliars you, you're not just feeding the plant you're feeding the young yeah. new ecosystem you're trying to build yeah. Yeah. yeah were we talking about a seed or a folia just then i'm just getting into context um, both, both. Okay. yeah but yeah. once once again like uh, it comes down to when are you going to put these things out and and how, how are you going to do it so yeah um, the reason i asked that question is um so if you're coating your seed with nutrisoil the biggest benefit there is that it's protecting it um, yeah. from your pests and diseases building yeah. that immunity of the plant so that's you, you're you're protecting it but you're also giving it that nutrient around yeah. it with what you were saying yeah. um, and and similar to a folio we're talking same yeah. things here and there's um, always a risk if you if you have been pickling and using insecticides and to sort of protect the plant because you've got the risk of the pests and diseases. So there's a, obviously there's a risk whenever you pull one of those support mechanisms, yeah. support props away from the crop, yeah. plant crop system. So it is a bit of a risk, but I guess you're trying to do things that encourage a beneficial microbiome and reduce the negative things that, that take it backwards. Yeah. And so it's a balancing act. So if we still have to use a few in biocides, what am I doing to actually do the other side of yeah. the ledger because yeah. up until now you mightn't have been doing much on the other side of the ledger yeah. Yeah. so you're just trying to change it up yeah. yeah that's exactly what we were talking about just earlier so a lot of people will say the first thing you do is you cut out the pickle but if you're in this system where it's not functioning that might not be the first thing that you yeah. do that the first thing might be to start reducing the fertilizer until you get yeah. that or soil add some structure buffering or biology yeah. to yeah. help it and so you just it's all soils are all about an equilibrium yeah. between forces that take it backwards and forces that help build yeah. it up and yeah. you've got a farm but you've just got yeah. to try and balance that equilibrium mm. and the pre and post herbicides not many people are in systems where we're not using herbicides at the yeah. moment um, in broadacre agriculture so how can you buffer it um, so using your fulvic yeah. citric there's some pre-made um, uh, options available yeah. as well yeah. or you can make it yourself yeah yeah, yeah. do all those sorts of things um, and there, are, I think they're just a must have in okay. in them. Uh, is you put a bit of fulvic or humic in there uh, when you're when you're using those things, just to help um, yeah buffer the situation, buffer the and and help the plants. It helps seems to help the plant recover faster as well. So a lot of those herbicides, even if they're selective, they have a impact on the non-target species. Yeah so that you know they're subclinically poisoning the whole show yeah. so you're just trying to kind of help those yeah. fellas not get too much poisoning yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, our next question is about rice um, again it's pretty specific so what is the effect of flooding on heavy rice soil of a pH 4.3 for 12 weeks um, David you're I'm oh, well, I've started off. Obviously, Luke works a bit with some rice growers. I've yeah. started to work with a couple. Um, but basically, when you waterlog something and you kick all the oxygen out of it, the, the biochemistry, particularly in the soil solution, but also the organic matter part of your soil or the humus part, um, it all changes big time. The type of reactions that happen, it all shifts. So, for example, the nitrogen cycling pathway changes, so you get more potential for it to move in a different direction um, so yeah you get you get a number of different changes that go on so I guess the longer it's flooded for the the more it shifts into this new state which for say for trace elements some trace elements really lock up at that low pH um, in the soil solution and others might actually become out in toxic levels so it, yeah. it just changes the game um, but the second thing is you've kicked out the air and the water so the aerobic guys are not going to be happy and yeah. they'll have to bounce back and it is that lag time after it's drained away yeah. so yes it does affect things yes rice grows well in it it's an adapted plant so it's all it's a wetland plant if you like so but if you're then trying to grow other things afterwards yeah you've just got the challenge of rebooting that soil to an aerobic soil which yeah. does take a bit of transition because you have thrown the party out you've changed from a pub full of aussie rule supporters to one full of nrl supporters and now you want to change it back straight away but you know, it's always going to be a bit of a yeah. transition <laughs> process. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Luke, do you want to comment on that? And I'm not. Uh, I'm I, not quite sure. Are they asking about the rice actually as a crop, or are they asking about um, those break periods afterwards of the of they've got uh, soil that has had rice? Because we were just talking earlier. That's your real opportunity. You've you've got your rice crop where you you do have yeah. those flooded soils. But what's your opportunity to build it for the next rice crop? So yeah, I, I would always. Um, when I'm building my soil for the next rice crop, I'd have a multi-species high legume um, crop in there um, to get ready for that. But I think, and we're going to get really specific here, I think we need to start breeding our rice back to back away from having it to be to flooded. Flight. So dry land rice or yeah. upland rice. So yeah, yeah there's, there's uh, systems around the world where they're growing really good yields of rice on a two-week two flood situation so your soil could probably cope with being flooded for two weeks yeah when we did our last live with Walter Yana he said it's probably got about a 10 day buffering system before yeah. those microbes really start to shift yeah. their um, yeah. yeah balance so that's that's uh, that's a thing for the rice industry that they really need to look at like they can pull their 14 15 ton crops no problems at all because they're doing it around the world um, but yeah how do we transition across to that yeah, it's a challenging one because it is such an intensive, yeah. and, and especially if rice is part of a three or four year cycle, yeah. you know, you're going from a wetland crop to aero and you've, you've got to change your soil back. So I guess, the yeah, in a way you could say, well, keep the soil in really good structure, but obviously when you're growing rice, you actually want to seal yeah. it off and let it get oh, wet. So. And there is one great thing about rice, it has a staggeringly big root system. Mm. So it does, yeah. if you, when I do soil tests, I quite often find that rice paddocks have the best organic carbon yeah. in them because yeah. they have such a big root system and they have a, a big biomass. Because organic yeah. matter. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah we do the, get that question a lot um, with rice. Do I use Nutrisoil on rice? Look, early days, but um, our, our recommendation would be definitely in that building process, just, getting as much biology. Just yeah. tip it into the... Yeah, the dam again. and and, yeah. and let it run down the river and, and everybody can have it. Just yeah. inject, I'm trying to help people here. Into, you. <laughs> into Dartmouth Dam, like ten thousand yeah. liters a day, you'd be right. Yeah. Also, do nutrients leach under flooded water? Well, if the water's if the ground's sealed and that's where you've got that wetland and they're not moving very much down yeah. because that's why the water's standing there. Yeah, but they do. Yeah, the dynamics of that nutrient release from the organic matter into the soil solution so they can stay dissolved in your water and then yeah. if your water moves off the paddock yeah. it's going to, be, going to be carrying some of them. And the thing about nitrogen of course is the volatilisation or the loss of N that way happens yeah. under anaerobic conditions yeah. Yeah. quite strongly. Yeah. Mm. Do you think um, David that um, some of the brews that you do would be good in rice because they've got the the bacillus which can survive mm. a bit better I, in I the... think this is an area where we've got to explore yeah. these kind of things yeah. yeah can we create a microbiome that's really good for wetland yeah. soils like yeah. and it can live rice. in acidic conditions yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. well the ph 4.3 is the second problem isn't it yeah. so yeah, yeah. yeah. because yeah. we're assuming there's not much nutrient cations like calcium around and yeah. you know might have aluminium mucking around so you know there's those other balances going on. Yeah. Mm. Um, that's the last of our case studies and questions. I, I could keep going with a few more that I've got. What's our time like? Shelley? Yeah yeah. Well let's I'll, I'll fire away a few curly ones because <laughs> that's what they really wanted. <laughs> Um, I've just done the RCS online regenerative cropping course and our big debate was um, bare fallow or brown manuring um, and what what is is brown manuring a good transition tool to keep that fallow over the period does it hold the nutrients what's the benefit of it because you want him to in a cash cropping situation spray that out that multi species out before seed set I think it's different in pasture cropping because that's got that seasonal um, so it actually goes into senescence for you when you spray yeah. it out but when you've got a, a a multi-species uh, crop that has the potential to uh, infect the next crop um, it is a common thing to spray it out first um, brown manuring what happens to the nutrients and how long do they stay in that brown manure so probably the best 
lesson that we can all learn is the cane, sugar cane industry. So um, in the, the cane industry, most people would be aware they're trying to manage their nutrients because they live next to the barrier reef. So they've actually done lots of work on the benefit of having a trash blanket, they call it in cane, or, and or using cover crops of legumes. And then what do you do with the cover crop? Because it's holding nitrogen for you because you're in, the wet, in a four metre rainfall zone or more and you can lose your nitrogen. So they've done quite a lot of work looking at that. So I guess the, the principle is that if you have a lot of, say, cover crop biomass that's got legumes and nitrogen in it, if you just lie that down and let it slowly decompose, which brown manuring kind of does as well, um, you just lay it down and let it slowly decompose over the next period, then it, it continues to break down and release the nutrients from that biomass. And so you get a steady release. If you plough that in, you get this big flush of nitrogen in particular or and the other nutrients out into the soil. And if I haven't got a plant root or a cover crop to then take that flush of nutrients up, then the potential is I'll lose it. Um, so yeah, so I guess if you ploughed in as a green manure, it breaks down really quickly and gives you a flush of nutrients. And if I just hay it off or brown it off with a chemical and then lay it down, it's a much slower release pattern. It's like kind of like steady release. Yeah. And when you give it that flush of nutrients, that tends to be, I find, is when <coughs> our weed burden jumps. The nitrate weeds. They, they just fly out around at 100 mile an hour or so. And the other thing with that is to have that cover on the ground is so important because I've taken, with a thermometer uh, gun, I've taken soil temperatures of 75 degrees on the surface of the soil. So that's, nothing's going to survive in that. And we're here, we're trying to build biology. So to have that, that covered up and, and yeah, protected physical, is so, imper- is so important. And then I've gone six feet away underneath a living plant, it was 34 degrees. So a huge difference. Yeah. So I guess the principle is if you've got the rainfall and the seasonal conditions, having living plants as much as possible because of the active root activity yeah. is the best thing. But if you have a seasonal cropping system and you're going through that crop sequence and you just you have to sort of stop the cover crop to get ready for the next crop, etc., then a brown manure or any kind of residue on the surface is going to be a benefit and if you've grown a cover crop and got nitrogen in that biomass then you are if you don't plow it in if you just stop it and drop it it will give you a steady release but if you do tillage and stuff you're just going to ramp up the release it's going from low gi to high gi carbs basically so yeah you you, so brown manuring is a good sort of second tactic and it will slow down the release of that nitrogen and hopefully if you've got something growing into that breaking down material um, it will start to take up that nitrogen. So you're kind of connecting the nitrogen in your cover crop biomass to your following crop. And so, but it, and it's not just on the surface, remember, you've got root volume as well yeah. breaking down. So you're trying to connect the two, because if you don't, you'll have all this excess nitrogen, which could go all kinds of places. Mm. Yeah. And I think, uh, depending on your situation, of course, but then if you had that long lag between the next cash crop, Another option is to spray it out and put another Māori species in. So obviously not huge broad acre low rainfall areas, but if you're talking about your smaller areas, just always that green living plant, how can you get it in there profitably? Yeah, yeah. 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 Michigan State University had a term 30 years, 40 years ago, they said the carbon growing season. That's their term for kind of keeping something alive yeah. as much as you can in your crop yeah. cycle and yeah. seasonal yeah. conditions. Yeah. 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 yeah, let's get that in our so head. Carbon, carbon growing, growing season. season. So yeah, yeah, if you have to brown out or terminate, then do it. And but the less you disturb that material, the slower the release of the nutrients, which is usually a good thing. Unless you're growing lettuce or weeds, nitrate-loving weeds, yeah. or if you're growing a quick crop like lettuce, where you want to kind of get that boost on yeah. it. But otherwise, just let it slow go slowly decompose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what the guys saw in um, uh, in the cane industry to help sort of manage that nitrogen. Yeah, and I think too it's important that you lay it down, and you get that little bit of soil contact on it so it can break down. Like standing stubbles, I've gone into paddocks, and you can go, well, that was three years ago crop, that was four years ago crop, and you can actually see 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 the stubble mm. standing there, and it hasn't broken down. They're just sowing into it and harvesting it. Yeah, and you have less of that physical benefit of yeah. that temperature yeah. regulation yeah. and moisture evaporation yeah. control, all of those other yeah. benefits that 
yeah. sometimes we forget oxidation yeah. of carbon that yeah. you get right great, great for wind erosion but not water yeah. so yeah. much yeah so. yeah those things. Yeah, so when you talked about that trash blanket, it yeah. was brown manuring and laying it down. Yeah, so, well, the trash blanket itself, I guess, is like a mulch, but if you grow a mouldy species in cane, the guys will grow a mouldy species nitrogen focused legume mix. Yeah. And then the, the challenge is okay, do we just knock it down or do we spray it out? Knock it down, spray it out. Um, but the research really clearly showed that if you ploughed it in, you get this big flush of mineralization and release of end. And if I haven't got any root systems to start taking that up in the next little while, quite little while, it's gonna go, yeah. you know. So um, let's get, let's try and match the two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just thinking broad acre, uh, if there was no opportunity to knock it down and you just sprayed it out, is that still of benefit? Yeah, any biomass yeah. in a paddock's better than that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, they're all, options but anything's better than nothing yeah 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 mm, okay. and, and I, that, that's the, such an important part of this whole topic is you do what you can do yeah if if you can't achieve something don't beat yourself up over it just do what you can do yeah and and take those little steps forward and celebrate the steps don't yeah. look at the problems that's... sound like my mum <laughs> Um, look, I think we've solved lots of problems of the world today. I hope, we, I hope we've helped some people. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants to follow up on any of this, um, you can contact us at Nutrisoil, um, Luke at uh, Regen Farming and David at Soil Land Food. He might not answer his phone as quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone we really appreciate the time and um, lots of online courses workshops sort of webinar stuff to support everyone over the next 12 months so yeah keep 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 following everything on, on the social media yeah. Yeah. yeah learn build community yep. what else take the time it takes take time it'll it takes. take less time yeah if you're jumping in and out of these things yeah it's um yeah it's it just slows the whole process down. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and we will be resharing this recording, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I just want to leave it on that note of that carbon building season. Yeah. That's fantastic, carbon isn't growing. it? You've yes. now got a carbon building season. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yes. thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day.